microbiology so some laboratory microbiology coming at you so let's start off with the bacteria cell structure bacteria are unicellular organisms with a cell wall and a cell membrane okay now they range in size from the same size as the largest virus which is mycoplasma to nearly the size of a human red blood cell which is the bacilli okay now bacteria are divided into number one bacilli number two cocci and number three spirochetes now bacilli are let's get a new page for this bacilli are rod shaped rod shapes and they're typically large bacteria okay now cocci are round shaped round shaped and they are typically small typically small they can be sub subdivided now into diplococci dipso diplococci appearing in pairs um streptococci appearing in chains appearing in chains and number three staphylococci appearing in clusters so and then we have the spirochetes Now, the spirochetes are spiral shaped. So now that we have that very general understanding, let's let's go back and talk about it. Um, the cell wall is made up of an inner layer of peptidoglycan or peptido, yeah, peptidoglycan and an outer membrane of variable thickness. Now, peptidoglycan forms a rigid network with a carbohydrate, a carbohydrate backbone, okay, with branching tetrapeptides. It provides the support to withstand what? Osmotic pressures, all right, and it is found only in bacterial cell walls. It's found only in bacteria cell walls and know that it withstands the um, osmotic pressures now that brings us to an immunological correlate the lysosome actually let's go back right here The lysosome is an enzyme present in tears and other mucosal secretions that does what? It cleaves peptidoglycan. So once peptidoglycan is cleaved, the bacteria cells are lysed by, what do you think they're lysed by? What we talked about. Osmotic pressure, exactly. Water rushes in the cell, it bursts, there you go. Um, now, the cell walls of gram-negative bacteria, not gram-positive, but gram-negative bacteria, they contain something called an endotoxin. Endotoxin, which is a lipopolysaccharide. Okay, and we're going to talk about that a lot more here in the next little bit. Um, but also another immunolo immunology, immunology correlate 
is many of the components of the bacteria cell wall are antigenic and can be assayed to determine the etiology of an infection. So that's where we're going with that. Now, the cell wall of bacteria is spanned by something called porins. Porins are proteins that transmit small hydrophilic molecules. Many antimicrobials, such as penicillins, enter interbacterial cell walls through porins. Okay? Now, um, the cytoplasmic membrane is a phospholipid bilayer, just like ours. The membrane perform, performs three important functions. Active transport of molecules into the cell, synthesis of precursors of the cell wall, and energy generation through OxFos, or oxidative phosphorylation. This function differentiates it from eukaryotic cells, which perform oxidative phosphorylation across where? You tell me. The inner mitochondrial membrane. Exactly. Very good. Now, mycoplasma lack a cell wall, having only a membrane. This is the only exception to the presence of a cell wall in bacteria. So you might want to remember that. Mycobacterium That's important to know. Now, what is the only my mycobacterium that is lethal or deadly? That's right, TB. There are tons of types of mycobacterium. We're not even going to get into that. But if you're ever curious, look them all up because you never know what the boards might ask you about. Um, most people know mycoplasm, pneumonia, mycoplasm, TB. But there's like 15 mycoplasm uh, bacteria. So, anyways, bacterial cytoplasm has two distinct regions on microscopy, an amorphous matrix and an inner nucleoid region containing DNA. Ribosomes and granules are where they're found in the amorphous matrix, okay? Ribosomes Ribosomes and granules are found in the a amorphous amorphous matrix of the bacteria. Now, there's a histology correlate here. Um, Corne bacterium diphtheria contain granules of volutin. Okay which stains red with methylene blue, and that's what creates the characteristic metachromatic granules, okay? It's this pollutant right here um, that does that. Now, the nucleoid region containing bacterial DNA, which we're going to talk about much more, um, you know what, don't even worry about that for right now. I just want you to note that bacteria lack organelles. A lot of people don't know that. Bacteria lack organelles. The resemblance of bacteria to mitochondria, given their use of the cell membrane to generate ATP via the electron transport chain, supports the theory that eukaryotic cells phagocytize bacteria in a relationship that eventually became dependent and symbiotic. So they 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 think that you know there, there's something there. Because that, that would make a lot of sense to support that, um, that endosymbiotic theory. Now, um, moving on to bacterial genetics. First up, we have transposons. What is a transposon? They are highly mobile pieces of DNA. Highly mobile pieces of DNA, meaning that they often change position within the bacterial chromosome. Chromosomal bacterial DNA is a single circular molecule 
located in the nucleoid region of the cytoplasm. All right, that's very important to remember that. So what is a plasmid? A plasmid is a small circular DNA molecule that replicate independently of the bacterial chromosome. Now, it's very important to note they are not necessary for bacterial survival. They're not necessary for bacterial survival. Now, transmissible plasmids can be transferred from one bacteria to another via conjugation. Um, these plasmids contain the genes necessary for the synthesis of the sex pilus, okay? The structure that allows conjugation. Okay? Now, non-transmissible plasmids do not contain the genes for the synthesis of the sex pilus, and so they cannot be transmitted via conjugation. So that's what all that is about. Now, plasmids code code for genes that enhance bacterial survival. And this is where you get antibiotic resistance, resistance to heavy metals, resistance to even ultraviolet light. Um, they also code for pili or fimbriae, which mediate adherence to the host cell surface, and also exotoxins. Now, transfer of genetic material between bacteria occur in any of three ways. And that is number one, conjugation, which involves the production of the sex pillus and the transfer of genetic material through the pillus. Number two, transduction, is the transfer of genetic material via a bacteriophage. Okay? Now, bacterial DNA is incorporated into the viral, viral genetic material, then incorporated in another infected bacterial cell. That's how transduction works. And then number three, we have transformation. This is the uptake of DNA from extracellular environments into a viable bacterial cell. This is often used in laboratory investigations, okay? Often used in laboratory investigations. So that is the uh, transfer genetic material between bacteria, and that's how they occur in those three ways. So bacterial metabolism Now, bacteria reproduce by something called binary fission, and as a result, exhibit exponential growth. We've all seen those exponential growth charts of bacteria, and it's binary fission that lets them do this. Now, binary fission occurs when a single parent produces two identical progeny, okay? The bacterial growth cycle has four main stages that you need to be aware of. That is number one, the lag phase, number two, the log phase, number three, the stationary phase, and number four, the death phase. Now the lag phase is a high, they have a high metabolic activity, but no division, okay? Now, the log phase is where the cells are rapidly dividing. So there's a rapid cellular division. The stationary phase is where they become nutrient depleted or nutrient depletion and toxin accumulation slow cell growth and division. And the death phase is a decline in the number of viable bacteria due to nutrient depletion and toxin accumulation, not depletion, but toxin accumulation occurs in the death phase. That's when most bacteria release their toxins in the death phase, except for Neisseria, which he actually releases his, um, I believe it's in the, the log phase. So bacteria, how do they generate ATP? They do it using the electron transport chain. Now, because bacteria cells lack a mitochondria, that's important, don't forget that, they lack a mitochondria, the proton gradient is formed across the cell membrane, is formed across the cell membrane rather than 
the mitochondrial inner membrane as in us, eukaryotes. Bacteria of the genus, uh, the genus Chlamydiae do not generate their own ATP. Okay, these bacteria are obligate intracellular bacteria. Um, bacterial ribosomes differ in size from eukaryotic ribosomes. Okay, they complete ribo the complete ribosome is 70s. The complete ribosome for bacteria is 70s with a 50s and a 30s subunit. Now. This gives us a pharmacology correlate here. The differences between bacterial and human ribosomes forms the basis for the efficacy of many antibiotics. So thank gosh they have different ribosomal subunits than we do. The antibiotics impair the bacterial ribosome, but not the human ribosomes because they're different. They're, being, they're not targeting us. These drugs include the aminoglycosides, tetracyclines, chloramphenicol, macrolides, clindamycin, lisonolid, and streptogramins. Okay, so that's that's a pharmacology correlate there, is these ribosomes um, are, are different between us and bacteria, and that's how we can target them. Now, obligate um, aerobes are usually referred to as aerobes because they require oxygen. Now, they use oxygen. Why, why do they use oxygen? It's the final electron acceptor, the same as in us at complex four, like in eukaryotic cells. So they express superoxide dismutase and catalase. They express number one, superoxide dismutase, which we've talked about, and number two, catalase. Um, to, and they do that to prevent free radical damage. And that brings us to an immunology correlate. Now, what disorder in which free radicals generated is impaired in immune cells. CGD, chronic granulomatous disease, is a disorder in which free radical generation is impaired in immune cells. The result is that these patients suffer recurrent infection with aerobic bacteria aerobic bacteria because these bacteria express free radical neutralizing enzymes, superoxide dismutase, and catalase. That's why they're so deadly to these people with this disease. Now that brings us into facultative anaerobes. Um, these use oxygen when present but can continue metabolism in the absence of oxygen, hence facultative. They ultimately utilize fermentation pathways in the absence of oxygen. So that's how they work. Now the obligate anaerobes, they lack superoxide dismutase. So remember that. The obligate anaerobes lack superoxide dismutase, catalase, or both. Uh, and they cannot grow in the presence of oxygen. They're an obligate anaerobe. Clinical laboratories can differentiate bacteria based on which sugars they metabolize and how they metabolize them. So that is why this is important. Now, what is essential to bacteria for their cellular growth? Iron. You better believe it. Iron. Big time. Remember that. Iron is essential. Now, Human iron binding proteins such as transferrin are upregulated in disease to prevent iron utilization by bacteria. How cool is that? We actually upregulate our transferrin. to keep it from the bacteria, to prevent it. So that brings us into citophores. These are bacterial proteins that procure iron for bacterial use. Now what's the clinical correlate here? Anemia of chronic disease is a form of anemia that results when a chronic inflammatory state causes the body to sequester iron so effectively 
that it denies its own need for iron. Now, the treatment of the underlying disease um, results in resolution of the anemia, but that's the clinical correlate there with anemia of chronic disease. So now, DNA viruses. And remember, this is a general overview of laboratory microbiology, and so that's why I'm just being kind of giving you a general um, understanding of this stuff. So all DNA viruses except one guy, the pox virus, replicate in the nucleus, which makes complete sense, right? It's DNA. Um, now, the hepatovirus or hepatitis B virus replicate, replicates partially in the nucleus and the cytoplasm. Now, there's some DNA enveloped viruses that you need to be aware of. Number one, that's herpes virus, which a unique feature of these viruses is that the envelope of these viruses comes from the host cell's nuclear membrane. Now, the families of them include HS or herpes simplex type 1, type 1 and type 2, um, the Barcella zoster virus, Marcella uh, zoster virus, uh, CMV, cytomegalovirus, um, Epstein-Barr virus, EBV, and the human herpes virus 8. So those are the herpes viruses. Now, the hepatinovirus or the hepatitis B virus, this is the only DNA virus of the hepatitis viruses, the only one so anytime there's an only always remember that because you're going to be tested on it may the boards love this guy now the pox virus includes smallpox smallpox and mus molluscum contagiosum now except for smallpox which has been eradicated um, thank God these viruses are all spread by direct contact that means they are enveloped all spread by direct contact and cause lifelong infections except for which one smallpox now they may clinically be silent and opportunistic which makes a lot of sense um, so let's continue now with DNA non enveloped viruses So these are the DNA non-enveloped viruses. The first one up is adenovirus. This is a common cause of upper respiratory infections. That's all I want you to remember. Upper respiratory infections, adenovirus. Now the papilloma virus causes papillomas of the epithelium. So these are what are warts. Okay. Now parvovirus B19, pay attention to this guy. Boards love to ask you about him. Um, he causes the slap cheeks in children. Slap cheeks in children, also known as erythema infectiosum, also causes hydrops fecalis, anemia, since it affects the RBC precursors, and parvovirus B19 will shut down your bone marrow. Very important to know that, one of the only viruses that has that ability. Um, now, the polymyrovirus is the JC virus, and that's the cause of progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy and the BK virus. 
So the JC and the BK virus. Now the BK virus is the cause of renal disease in AIDS patients. Renal disease, think BK virus, which is a polymyovirus. Moving right along, that brings us to exotoxins and endotoxins. Now an endotoxin is a component of the cell wall of gram-positive or gram-negative bacteria. That's right, gram-negative. The pathogenicity of endotoxin is thought to be related to a component known as lipid A. Remember that. Endotoxin is released from bacteria upon bacterial death, like we talked about, the death phase. Now endotoxin causes the release of endogenous pyrogens such as tumor necrosis factor alpha, IL-1, which causes fever, etc. It also increases vascular permeability, which we talked about before, and it initiates, this is very, very, very important, it initiates coagulation and complement cascades. So that's why you can get DIC with endotoxin, okay, disseminated in intravascular coagulation. Um, you can also get hypotension, um, sepsis, shock, etc. Endotoxin is very dangerous. Now, exotoxins are bacterial products that are excreted from the bacteria and confer an advantage to the organism. There may be, there are many different exotoxins that can be released from gram positive and gram negative bacteria. Okay, they can encode for the back for um, bacterial chromosomes, plasmids, or phages, okay? In other words, genes encoding for exotoxins can be transferred, can be transferred from one bacteria to another, conferring the same pathogenicity. That's very important to understand that. Now, increased levels of the second messenger cyclic AMP uh, change the impulse of transmission in nerves, they act as super antigens. That's important. They act as super antigens, which causes the release of cytokines, leading to various systemic effects. They change various cellular components, and they also interfere with protein synthesis. Anything that does that can't be good. Um, so exotoxins can be highly, highly toxic. highly toxic, and thus bacteria which produce them may cause severe morbidity and mortality. Some notable bacteria that produce exotoxin and life-threatening illnesses, just to name a few, is Clostridium difficile, Clostridium tetani, Clostridium botulism, Shigella species, and Corny bacterium diphtheriae. Just to name a few. Now, specific exotoxins, their mechanism and genetics are discussed later on individual bacteria. Um, so, if you really want to know uh, specific mechanisms and genetics, go to the bacteria um, section of these lectures. So, that's the big picture. So, let's move on to fungal metabolism. Good old fungi. So, what do I need to know? Well, let's look at hyphae. Hyphae are long structures formed by connected fungal cells. Now, hyphae growth occurs as individual fungal cells within the hyphae undergo what? Mitosis. Under, they gotta undergo mitosis. Now, a good drug, greciofulvin, inhibits the fungal cell mitotic spindle. Therefore, you get an inhibition of mitosis and hyphae growth. So, greciofulvin is a good drug for stopping mitosis in fungi. Now, Fungi contain a cell wall that is different from the cell wall of plants and bacteria. It is made up of proteins and the polysaccharide mannan, 
glucan and chitin. It is the ex it is external to the cell membrane. Now, 1,3-beta-glucan synthase is the enzyme that catalyzes the synthesis of glucan. Of glucan. Now, econocadins inhibit this enzyme, and there you get cell wall instability. So let's write that in there. Echinocadins. I can't pronounce that for crap. Echinocadins inhibit 1,3-beta-glucan synthase, and therefore what happens? You get a cell wall instability of the fungi. Now, fungal cells contain the enzyme um, cytosine deaminase, which converts flu, flu cytosine to products that interfere with DNA and RNA synthesis. So you need to know that. Cytosine deaminase, remember that guy. Now fungi, unlike bacteria and viruses, are actually eukaryotic. It is important to know that. Bacteria and viruses are not eukaryotic, but fungi are. Now fungi are heterotrophs, Heterotrophs, they consume already formed organic material. They consume oxygen via oxidative phosphorylation where? In the cell membrane? No, they're eukaryotes in the mitochondria. Okay, so that brings us to something called ergesterol. What is, what is ergesterol? Sounds a lot like cholesterol, doesn't it? Ergesterol is the major sterile of fungal cell membranes. And the way it works is you get squalene, squalene, which goes to oxidosqualene, which goes to lansterol, a little biochemistry here for you, which ends up as ergesterol. So that's how you get it. There are two clinically significant enzymes in the ergesterol synthesis pathway. And that's number one, squalene epoxidase, which catalyzes the reaction squalene to oxidosqualene. This enzyme is targeted by the alamines. Targeted by the alamines. All right. And then you also have 14 alpha demethylase, which catalyzes the conversion of lansterol to ergesterol, and it is targeted by the azole drugs, okay? Now, polyenes, polyenes bind to already synthesized ergesterol and disrupt its interactions within the cell membrane. And what is that going to do? It's going to increase membrane permeability. So therefore, potassium is going to leak out. Sodium is going to follow its concentration gradient in. It's going to pull chloride. And guess what? It pulls water and we lyse the cell. So, um, that's basically how that happens. So let's talk about the fungal structure. Um, fungi, like we said, are eukaryotic organisms with cell walls and cell membranes that have important differences from human cells, even though they are eukaryotes. Um, the cell walls contain chitin, glycan, and mannan. The cell wall contains ergesterol instead of in humans, it's cholesterol. Now, there's a pharmacology correlate here. 14, 14 demethylase, 14 demethylase, a fungal P450 enzyme,
converts lansterol to ergosterol. Now, what targets this enzyme? What group of drugs? The azoles. The azoles target this guy. 14 demethylase. Okay? Now, polyenes disrupt fungal membranes by binding to already formed ergosterol, like we talked about. Fungi contain microtubules. And that's how they undergo mitosis. And what drug inhibits mitosis by interfering with the mitotic spindle of fungi? Griseofulvin. Very good. That's what we already talked about. Good job. Now, what, what inhibits the synthesis of glycan? That's the word I can't pronounce, the echinocadins. Now, fungi generally exist in one or two, of two forms. They're either a mold or a yeast, okay? Dimorphic fungi can interchange between these two forms depending on what? The temperature. So, temperature is what controls what, which one they are. Now, a mold is a multicellular fungal colony. Hyphae Hyphae are long tubular structures formed by multiple fungal cells lined up end to end. Now, dimorphic fungi that exist as a mold, they do that at body temperature. Now, a great example of that is Candida. Candida albicans. Candida albicans. Now, the yeast... The yeast is a single-celled fungus that replicates how? By budding. That's how he works. He replicates by budding. Now, this is where you get pseudo hyphae. Pseudo hyphae are formed when buds fail to break off the original yeast cell, forming long chains that resemble Hyphae. So fungi that exist as yeast at body temperature, let's talk about a few of those guys. Histoplasmosis. Blastomycosis. Coccidiomycosis. Paracoccidiomycosis, and number five, Sportrix. They love this guy on the USMLE. Remember Sportrix. Okay, those are fungi that exist as yeast at body temperature. Now, most fungi exist as what? Molds at ambient temperature. Just remember this, mold equal cold, and most fungi exist as yeast in the body. So yeast equals heat. Mold in the cold, yeast in the heat. Okay, moving right along, that takes us to gram-negative bacteria. So the gram-negative cocci, if you ever hear that, they are talking about one thing, Neisseria species. What if you hear gram-negative rod or anaerobe? They're talking about the Bacteroides species, okay? Now, gram-negative bacteria contain lipopolysaccharide, which is nothing more than endotoxin. It's a fancy way of saying endotoxin, so don't let that fool you. Now, peptidoglycan and gram-negative bacteria is thinner. It's a single layer, actually. There's no tecloic acid. As in gram-positive bacteria. And these appear what on the gram stain? They appear red. Very important to remember that. They appear red 
on the gram stain because they do not absorb crystal violet. Remember, you're responsible on the boards for knowing how to gram stain something and, and the steps in that. So don't go crazy with it, but just you know, know your basics. And that's what we're doing right now. Now, the gram negative rods, which are aerobes, include Bordetella pertussis, Brucella species, Franciella tularensis. I love saying that one. Um, Coxiella brunetti, Legionella pneumophilia, and Pseudomonas originosus. Very important guy. Um, and then you got your gram negative rods, which are facultative anaerobes, and these include Pasteurella multicolda, Haemophilus influenza, Vibrio species. Campylobacter species, Heliobacter species, E. coli. Gram negative rod, facultative anaerobe, E. coli. Klebsiella pneumonia, love to go for that one with alcoholics. Proteus species, Salmonella, Shigella, and what causes the bubonic plague, Yersinia pestisis. All right. Now, gram negative rods facilitate everything from land to sea. The one on land would be like Pastorella and Vibrio is in the sea. Um, also in the bladder, E. coli, which is the most common cause of UTIs, to the kidneys where the proteus species produces a urease and it increases the risk of urate nephrolithiasis. In the lungs, you can think about Klebsiella and ammonia. In the larynx, what are we going to think about? H. influenza, cause respiratory infections. In the stomach, we can go H. pylori, um, to diarrhea, um, both bloody, Shigella and Salmonella, and benign, like Campylobacter species. And like I said, the bubonic plague from Yersinia pestis. So they exist from the land to the sea, bladder, kidney, lungs, larynx, stomach, everywhere, to the bowels. So that's, that's a little overview of your gram-negative bacteria. So let's go on to the gram-positives. Up first is the gram-positive cocci which are aerobic and facultative anaerobes, this is your staph and strep. Staph and strep. Then you got gram-positive bacilli that are anaerobic and spore-forming. This is your clostridium species, okay? Clostridium tetanix, etc. Then you got gram-positive bacilli that are anaerobic and non-spore forming. This is Actinomyces israeli and Propionobacterium acnes. Okay, those are gram-positive bacilli. Now, gram-positive bacteria, this is important, contain tychoic acids. Okay, now the peptidoglycan wall is much thicker and multi-layered. It's like 40 layers thick. compared to the gram negative, where his peptidoglycan wall is one layer thick. Now, gram positive bacteria, um, there are no lipopolysaccharides. So what's that mean? There is no endotoxins in gram positives. And on gram stain, they appear, what color? They appear blue or violent on gram stain because why? They absorb the crystal violent. Now, the gram-positive bacilli are aerobic and facultative anaerobes. That's your corny bacterium species, your bacillus, and your aerosiporithix, whatever that, whatever that is. Just if you ever see that word, no, it's a gram-positive bacilli. I can't even pronounce it. Or rusiopathiae, aerosiporithix, rusiopathiae. So let's talk about the gram stain because you are you are responsible to know this. It's not crazy high yield, but it'll get you a point on the exam. And like we said, gram negative bacteria have a thin peptidoglycan uh, layer, so they do not retain crystal violent, but do retain something called saffron. They contain saffron, but not crystal violent. 
that because they retain saccharin, that's why they appear pink or red. Now the Gram stain process is very quick and separates bacteria into two general classes, Gram positive or Gram negative, as you might expect. Now, number one, what do you what do you do? You smear a sample on a slide and you fix the slide with heat. All right. Then you stain with crystal violet, which is blue, then wash with water. Number three, you precipitate the crystal violet with the addition of an iodine solution. Remember, you're, precip you're precipitating it here. Okay. Number four, you wash it with water and decolorize with alcohol. Decolorize it with alcohol. Number five, you stain with a counter stain saffron, which is red, and with water. So that it's it's literally that simple, and I know that's just straight memorization. I hate straight memorization, but you just remember that it's pretty simple. Um, now, gram-positive bacteria, where they have a thick peptidoglycan layer, retain what? Crystal violet, which makes them appear blue. All right. So other microbial staining methods include. The methamine solver, or also known as the GMS, and the PAS, which is the periodic acid shift stains. These are used for identifying various fungi. Fungi, most notably pneumocystis. Um, you also have the rites and the gemisa stains. Both use aniline dyes, aniline dyes, and are used to identify many poorly um, gram staining organisms like uh, a good example is rickettsia, chlamydia, borrelia, plasmodium, and toxoplasma are commonly stained with the rites or gamesa stains. Why? Because they don't gram stain right. And also another one that the boards I guarantee you will test you on is the Indian ink stain which is used to identify Cryptococcus neoformans um, because he has a capsule which is very unusual. Um, is a thick outer capsule, um, so it excludes the ink. Now, poorly gram staining bacteria, which we've already touched on, are rickettsia species. They are obligate intracellular organisms that do not survive outside the host cell. They are readily visualized in the gemesis stain. So rickettsia, you think of gemesis stain. Now mycobacterium uh, stain very poorly. These are acid fast, acid fast staining method is what we use to visualize them. Okay. Now chlamydia are obligate intracellular pathogens that are seen using fluorescent antibodies. fluorescent antibodies, or you can also use the gemesis stain that stains elementary bodies purple. Stains elementary bodies purple and the reticulate bodies blue. Okay, so definitely remember that. Now, spirochetes are spiral shaped bacteria, like we've talked about, that are not readily visible on gram stain due to their small diameter, though they are classified as what? Gram negative bacteria. These organisms include um, tryponema, um, leptospira. And one more, Borrelia. All right, and then mycoplasm species lack a cell wall, thus they do not gram stain. So other techniques we can use are immunofluorescence or the gemisa must be used actually for visualization of mycoplasm species.
So those are the poorly staining bacteria. RNA viruses, away from the bacteria and into the viruses. Okay, so we have an enveloped helical capsid positive sense single-stranded RNA. These are the coronavirus and SARS. So remember coronavirus. It's enveloped, it's a helical capsid, and it's a positive sense single-stranded RNA. Now, a non-enveloped icosahedral capsid double-stranded RNA is the rheovirus. And that um, is your rotavirus and your Colorado tick fever virus. RNA viruses may have single-stranded or double-stranded RNA genomes, segmented or non-segmented genomes, and their genomes may contain positive and or negative sense RNA. So that brings us into the enveloped icosahedral capsid positive sense single-stranded RNA viruses. Man, that's a mouthful, ain't it? So the main, these are the flaboviruses, which include hepatitis C, yellow fever, dengue, um, West Nile virus, I don't remember that one, um, and the St. Louis encephalitis virus. Then we have the toga viruses, which is your rubella virus, uh, your rubella virus, um, your mosquito-borne arboviruses, which are the Western equine encephalitis virus, the we, um, the Eastern equine encephalitis virus, and the Venezuelan encephalitis virus. Now, the more E's they have in it, the worse they are. This guy right here, EE, um, Eastern equine encephalitis virus, will kill you in a heartbeat. So, very dangerous. The more E's, the worse they are. Then we have the retroviruses, HIV-1, HIV-2, HTVL-1, and HTVL-2. Um, a lot of times I've seen questions on this one, HTVL-1. It was involved, um, I think it was Cesare syndrome or one of the uh, lymphomas. I can't remember which one, so look that up because the boards like to test on that. Um, now, enveloped. Helical capsid, negative sense, single-stranded RNA viruses are your paramyxoviruses. So you have parainfluenza, um, respiratory syncytial virus, that's a big one, RSV, the mumps, the measles, and the human metanumovirus, or the HMNV. Okay, that's what that stands for. And then you have the rabidoviruses, which are your rabies, your rabies virus, and your vesicular stomatitis. So, um, then you have your orthomyoxovirus, which is your influenza A, B, and C. Your filoviruses, which is the Ebola and the Marburg virus. Remember Ebola there. Then we get into enveloped helical capsid negative sense ambience single-stranded RNA. Now, note, in this context, amb ambisense means RNA segments that contain both positive and negative polarity, okay? That's what that means by ambisense right there. They have both negative or positive and negative polarity. So these are the arena viruses like Lassa fever virus or lymphocytic choriomeningitis, LCM. Then you have the Buna viruses, which is the hantavirus. That's an important one they like to test on. Then you have your California encephalitis virus, and you have the Rift Valley fever and the Sandfly fever. Then we have the non-enveloped icosahedral capsid, positive sense single-stranded RNA viruses. This includes the picornaviruses, which is the smallest RNA virus smallest RNA viruses divided into two groups, um, enteroviruses and rhinoviruses. So the enteroviruses include poliovirus, coxsackievirus, echovirus, and hepatitis A. Remember that one, hepatitis A. And also remember polio. All right. Um, your calciviruses are your Norwalk agent and your norovirus. And your hepivirus is hepatitis E virus. So that brings us now to RNA viruses can have a segmented genome. 
So what does this do? It allows for alternative packaging of genetic material and the creation of new recombinant strains with, vari with varied pathogenicity. Um, this includes the Bunya virus, the orthomyxovirus, the arenavirus, and the reovirus. So specialized back to, back to bacteria and away from viruses. I know that's, man, that's just a lot of memorization. I'm sorry, but there's really no way to go about it with that. Um, so back to bacteria. So bacteria have unique structures that serve specific functions. These structures are not universal, but can be important to the pathogenesis of specific bacteria. Um, for instance, bacteria capsules are gelatinous layers surrounding the entire bacterium. They're made up of polysaccharide and they vary among species. Now what's this capsule do? It prevents phagocytosis. by the immune cells. So there's an immunology correlate. A capsular antigens are species specific. So antibody attachment to the capsule causes the capsule to do what? Swell. This is a useful method of bacterial identification and it's called the Quellen, the Quellen reaction. Quellen reaction. Now, we also they also have pili or fimbriae, which are filaments extending from the bacterial cell surface. These what these do is they mediate attachment to human cell surface receptors. Okay, um, the clinical correlate here is strains of Neisseria gonorrhea. Neisseria gonorrhea, lacking the, pil the, the pilus, um, they're not pathogenic. The sex pilus mediates what? Conjugation between bacteria. So they also have flagella, which are long, thin protein, protein structures that serve for what? Propulsion. Flagellar proteins, like capsular and cell wall proteins, can be used to do what with bacteria? Identify them. Okay, now the glycocalyx is a polysaccharide coating secreted, secreted by bacteria that mediates adherence to a surface, mediates adherence to a surface. Now the glycocalyx is what, it, you've probably heard of this, this is what forms biofilms. There's a lot of research going on with this right now. Um, with these biofilms, which often form on foreign objects such as heart valves. Biofilms are what protect bacteria from antibiotics and the immune system. So it's this glycocalyx that does these biofilms. That's very important to know. Um, then you have spores. These are highly durable bacteria that can survive harsh conditions. They're formed by bacteria in the genera Bacillus and Clostridium. So both of those are your spore forming bacteria. It takes place in adverse conditions such as low nutrient content in the environment. Um, there's a keratin like coat Spores have a keratin-like coat um, and minimal intracellular machinery, which makes them extremely resistant to heat, dehydration, radiation, and chemicals. They have no metabolic activity and can survive for many, many years. Sterilization. So, yeah, how do we sterilize ourselves from these spores then? Um, if they can survive radiation, chemicals, dehydration, heat, etc., they don't denature. Um, you sterilize, sterilization is achieved by boiling them under pressure, which is known as autoclaving. Auto 
autoclaving for at least 30 minutes. And that's specialized bacterial structures. Now we have, let's do a summary of the growth media. All right, definitely pay attention to these because the boards love to test you on this stuff. Um, so let's start with the blood auger. It contains red blood cells and is used to detect hemolysis. It detects hemolysis. That's why we use a blood auger. A variety of bacteria can grow on this media and it is usually used before other growth media are tried. Okay, so you need to know that. This is usually to a blood auger. Now because mature red blood cells do not have a nucleus, obligate intracellular bacteria such as rickettsia and chlamydia will not grow on blood auger. Will not grow. Intracellular bacteria will not grow on blood auger. So that takes us to Barret Gigno or potato auger. Now this isolates Bordella pertussis. Isolates Bordella pertussis. Um, and increased blood concentration facilitates growth. Then we go on to chocolate yeast extract auger. This is buffered by cysteine. Buffered by cysteine and an increased concentration of what they need, iron. And what does this guy do? He isolates Legionella pneumophilia. So charcoal yeast auger or charcoal yeast extract auger, Legionella pneumophilia. So what about chocolate auger? This is made by cooking blood auger in order to inactivate growth inhibitors of Neisseria and Haemophilus. Okay, Neisseria and Haemophilus. Um, it's primarily used to isolate Neisseria gonorrhea and Neisseria meningitidis samples obtained from a sterile site. Okay. And we didn't write Haemophilus in there. And Neisseria. All right. So the chocolate auger plus factors X and V, this is used to isolate H influenza. Um, factors X and V are required for H influenza growth. That takes us into the egg yolk auger. This isolates Clostridium perfringens. Clostridium perfringens produces lecithinase, which degrades the lipids in egg yolk and produces a characteristic precipitate around the colonies. So that's why we use egg yolk auger for, for clostridium perfringens. Now EMB or eosin methylene blue auger is used for E. coli. E. coli. Um, this forms a brilliant green colonies which can be differentiated from the blue-black colonies of other gram-negative enterics, okay? Now, it also inhibits the growth of gram-positives and selects between lactose fermenters and non-lactose fermenters. And then we have the Lewisteen-Jensen auger. I know y'all probably not heard of that one, but this is, you, this is a very important one. It's used to isolate M. tuberculosis. So you want to be asked about this one. This inhibits the growth of gram positives that are normally found in the flora, in the flora of the respiratory tract. Okay? Then we have McConkie's auger. This inhibits growth of gram positives, and it's used to select between lactose fermenting and non lactose fermenting enteric gram negatives. Um, hmm, does that sound familiar? Just like which other one? Eosin methylene blue auger. Very good. Um, lactose fermenters on McConkie's auger grow in pink colonies. Pink colonies. Then we have the Taylorite auger. This is how you isolate Clostridium diphtheriae. Now, Clostridium diphtheriae colonizers have a black color. black color on Taylorite auger and due to the metabolism of Taylorite 
to tellurium. All right. Then you have the good old Thayer Martin media, or the Thayer Martin or the vancomycin niastatin polymyxin media. This is how you isolate Neisseria gonorrhea from non sterile sites. Definitely need to remember that guy. Um, vancomycin inhibits what? Gram positives. Um, so polymyxin is what inhibits gram negatives. Let's get us a new page for that because that's important. Okay, and ni nystatin inhibits what? You tell me. Nystatin inhibits fungal growth. Very good. All right. Um, so then that brings us to the triple sugar iron auger or the TSI auger. This can be used to isolate a variety of gram negative enteric rods. This determines the H2S and lactose fermenters. Now let's go on to the viral classification. So you have naked or non envelope another way of saying naked is non envelope viruses. Now the you have RNA and DNA viruses that are naked and the way to remember that is CPR and PAP. PAP um, so the CPR is the calcivirus, the picornovirus, and the rheovirus. These are RNA viruses. Okay. Now the parovirus, the adenovirus, the papilloma, and the polyomyome, or the polyoma virus, are all DNA viruses. Okay. Now, viral classification can be based on viral genetic material, capsid structure, and the presence or abs absence of an envelope. Now, other genetic material and capsid structure, there are many criteria that set viruses into different groups or families, such as a vector, like an arbovirus or insect-borne, or an area of infection, such as enteroviruses affect the GI tract. So that's what that's about. Now, um, viruses contain DNA or RNA as their genetic material, okay? DNA viruses tend to cause chronic infections. So just remember DNA, chronic infections, and they may reactivate. They may reactivate. Now, RNA viruses tend to cause acute illness. Acute illness, especially outbreaks in crowded or unsanitary conditions, such as perfect example is a daycare center, a school, or a cruise ship. So that brings us into a pharmacology correlate. Inhibitors of viral nucleic acid synthesis can target many steps in these pathways, but are specific to DNA viruses. So knowing which DNA vir which viruses are DNA viruses can therefore predict the efficacy of different drug therapies. So that's how that works. Now, viruses can be classified by whether or not they are enveloped. It's very important to know, enveloped. Enveloped viruses bud through a host cell membrane. Bud through a host cell membrane to do what? To obtain 
their envelope. That's how they attain their envelope of membrane phospholipids as an outer shell. This is protective and also allows the virus to slowly replicate and emit progeny from host cells rather than lysing the host cells <clears throat> when maximum viron production is reached. Now, non-envelope viruses are surrounded only by a coat of viral proteins known as capsid proteins. non-enveloped or capsid proteins. Now, cell-mediated immunity predominates compared to naked viruses, which depend more on what? Humoral immunity. Because viral glycoproteins on the surface of the cell trigger the immune response. This is incredibly important because when I think cell-mediated, right away I think virus, but there's actually some that can be humoral. So cell mediated immunity, 90% of the time, think virus, um, fungus, etc. But, but compared the um, the naked virus. Humoral immunity. And see, humoral immunity is more involved with antibodies and, and, and neutrophils, and they're more about engulfing bacteria and, you know, targeting bacteria. So cell-mediated immunity predominates um, viral, let's write this in here, viral glycoproteins on the cell surface, okay? So that is how that works. So viral replication and genetics. Viruses are obligate intracellular parasites, okay? Obligate intracellular parasites, which require a host cell, require a host cell to replicate. Viruses perceive, receive protection, um, nutrients, and enzymes from host cells. So the protection an example is like oxidative stress, acid-base extremes, the immune system. Nutrients are like amino acids and nucleotides. And enzymes is like DNA polymerase, ribosomes. They get all this from the host cell. They pretty much take us over. So viruses are small, which leads to the viral genomes are small, and viruses rarely contain proteins, which leads to the degree to, wh to which a virus pirates a host cell machinery depends on what? its size. That is very important to understand. Smaller viruses use more host cell machinery. Larger viruses contain or code more of their own machinery. So the smaller they are, the more they use you as a host. Okay, so viral replication requires seven things. It requires penetration of the host cell, viron uncoding, uncoding, number three, transcription of the viral mRNA, then translation of the viral RNA, which makes sense. Then you replicate the viral genome. Then you assemble it. You have assembly of virons. Then you release these virons through budding or through cellular lysis. So you can do it one of two ways. You can either bud or lyse the cell to release the virons that have been made that you replicated. So what is lysogeny? 
or actually let's go back before we talk about lysogeny I want you to know that most RNA viruses most RNA viruses replicate where cytoplasm Now, most DNA viruses replicate where? Remember, these are just your 90% rules. And the nucleus. And that makes complete sense. Envelope viruses bud through a host membrane to acquire their enveloped, so they do not lyse the cell. Now we can talk about lysogeny. Lysogeny is when viral DNA integrates with host cell DNA. Genes encoding bacterial exotoxins are often transmitted by bacteriophages in this way. Now, transduction is the transfer of genes from one bacterium to another via a virus or viruses. So genetic mutations are common in viruses. Viruses rely on bypassing normal safeguards of genomic integrity to replicate. So that brings us to a cellular biology correlate. Oncogenes are often activated and tumor suppressor genes are often deactivated by viral activity. A great example of this is the E6 and E7. Um, proteins of the human papillomavirus or HPV deactivate P53 which regulates the cell cycle and the RB host proteins which prevent replication of mutated cells so many virons are defective which re makes it require a high inoculation to infect. So we're, that brings us to a pharmacology correlate. Resistance to antiviral drugs develops rapidly due to mutations. Particularly, this is problematic in who? HIV and AIDS patients due to their long-term treatment. All right? And immunology speaking, for an immunology correlate, Changes in the influenza virus genome can result in changes in viral antigenicity. So influenza virus can cause devastating pandemics because of host immunity to it may be evaded by these mutations. So make sure that you pay attention to genetic mutations and that viruses can achieve. All right, and moving right along. Viral structure. The genetic material, RNA or DNA, is contained within a capsid and released upon entry into the host cell. Now, viruses are composed of a pro protective protein coat and an internal core of genetic material. Remember, viruses are obligate intracellular parasites which means they cannot live outside the cell. Viruses enter host cells and replicate through a variety of mechanisms. Viruses damage the host by disrupting normal host tissue or organ function. Now, the capsid or the outer protein coat of a virus is made up of repeating protein subunits. Caspids are always symmetric in one of two ways. They are either icosahedral or helical okay they are always symmetrical either number one icosahedral or helical now icosahedral viruses 
have the capsimers arranged in 20 triangles that form a shape roughly equivalent to a sphere. Twenty triangles that roughly form a sphere. All right. Now, helical viruses have capsimers arranged in a hollow. In a hollow rod-like coil. Okay, so that gives us an immunology correlate there. The surface proteins of viruses are the major antigenic component of the virus. It's the surface proteins. No, no surprise there. Since it is what is exposed to the serum of the host. This is why, for example, an antibody to hepatitis B surface antigen, HBS antibody, is used to measure, is used as a measure of immunity to hepatitis B. So that's how all that works. Now, viruses can be surrounded by an outer membrane called an envelope, which we have talked about a lot in this lecture. Envelopes are lipoprotein membranes derived from the host cell membrane. That's where they get it, okay? It is acquired when the virus buds. That's when it is acquired from the host cells into the external environment. Now, envelopes generally confer instability, okay? instability to viruses. All right, so envelope viruses tend to be less resistant to harsh environment environmental conditions. Let me say that again. Enveloped viruses tend to be less resistant to harsh environmental conditions. And that brings us to our last clinical correlate. Almost all envelope viruses are transmitted by direct contact. Insect bites or respiratory aerosol droplets. And almost all naked, or another way of saying naked, is non-enveloped viruses are transmitted by the fecal to oral routes. So that is general microbiology for you. I hope that helped and good luck on your Zoom.